Good morning, my name is Cadence. I am the worship leader for our youth band here. I also serve in the coffee bar and children's ministry. Today I'm gonna to be reading from Acts chapter 15, verses five through 11. It says, but some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. To the apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider the matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you. Uh, I want to say welcome to, to those of you who are here and your guests today. To those of you uh, watching us online, we're grateful that you have joined us. Uh, today I want to talk to you uh, about how the, cult, the, the church should respond when we find ourselves at odds with culture. Now, you may think, what in the world are you talking about? Well, uh, this past week you may have noticed uh, a noteworthy thing happened. A swimmer by the name of Leah Thomas won the NCAA women's uh, swimming, I think it was a 500 meter uh, championship there, blew all of the other uh, racers away. And, and that's not all that unusual. There were several NCAA championships going on. Uh, the reason that that is noteworthy is because Leah Thomas spent the first three of her years at the University of Pennsylvania swimming um, as a man on the men's team. And so, uh, some sort of conversion happened, and so you have a biological male competing now against women. And I read an article uh, from one of the mothers of the young ladies that competed uh, there in the NCAAs, and just listening to her and kind of the personal side of it, having a daughter who had spent her life, you know, the practices and the meets and the, the preparation and the training, all that had gone into it, and to feel like in some ways that was taken away from her because she had to compete against a, a biological male. That was a, a challenge for her. And then beyond that, some of the ways that the NCAA has handled it with regard to uh, allowing transgender men into the women's locker room. And just there's a lot there. Um, and if you feel a little bit unsure of how to respond, I don't think that's unusual. Uh, we live in a culture that is increasingly uh, secular, which means uh, increasingly kind of going after the ways of the world as opposed to following after Jesus. And so uh, you, we should not be surprised when we find ourselves at odds. Uh, if we're following Jesus and the rest of culture isn't, we shouldn't be surprised when our paths diverge in some ways. But it is important for us to say, as the people of God, as the church of Jesus Christ, how should we respond when we find ourselves at odds with culture? What do we do in the midst of this? Um, how do we carry ourselves and kind of live out the gospel in front of people as the church that God has sent here uh, to make disciples, to preach the gospel, uh, to teach people to obey everything he has commanded? Now, I'm not going to uh, walk through the whole uh, Leah Thomas issue and everything that we ought to do there. But what I'm going to attempt to do for us is just give us a couple of biblical principles to guide us. This is not the first situation that's been difficult for the church to walk through, and it will not be the last. And so today we're going to be looking at uh, Acts chapter 15. And there was a big philosophical argument uh, that had arisen in the church, and it was substantial, and it, it came at a tough time. If you've been with us through much of the Acts series thus far, you know that the gospel has just gone to the Gentiles. Paul and Barnabas had just completed their first missionary journey. People are getting saved right and left. Churches are being strengthened. Disciples are being built. They're appointing elders in every city. Like, everything is rolling along fine. And then, as often happens, this issue arises. It throws a wrench in the gears here. And so, look with me in Acts chapter 15. It says, but some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. 
Now, this is not like a, a minor issue. There are some things that in the church or outside we can all disagree on, right? Um, I, this is just who I am. I like brutal sports. I don't like, I used to say it this way, if girls play it, I don't want to. Uh, but really, I'm just not very good at sports that require much finesse about anything. And so uh, I once fouled out of a basketball game with five charging fouls, all right? I'm just like all aggression, no actual skill, all right? So um, that's who I am, though. Uh, my wife, uh, when it's her turn to pick and we're going to watch the Olympics, or what, you know what we have to watch? Gymnastics. Y'all, right? There are disagreements out there that I, I just let her do her thing. She lets me do my thing, and it's fine. Uh, there are disagreements in the church. This is the, the color of the carpet, which songs we sing on a given Sunday. There are lots of things that we can simply say we agree to disagree about. But there are some philosophical, moral, ethical issues that we don't just get to dis agree to disagree, right? What the uh, men from Judea are teaching here in the church at Antioch is if you aren't circumcised, you aren't saved. If you won't submit to this outward thing, kind of become like we are, then you can't walk with Jesus. You don't have hope for eternity. Like it's not going to go well for you in the end. And so, again, this is not an agree to disagree deal. This is really, really substantial. This is a profound disagreement that these men have brought into the church. And it was so significant that you see in, in verse 2 that Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them. And so the apostle Paul, Barnabas, they're like, oh, hold on, like slow down a little bit with regard to this teaching. Let's talk about it. But even with uh, Paul and Barnabas weighing in and kind of pushing back and trying to point them toward the truth of the gospel, it didn't necessarily settle it. So what do we do? We have our perspective and unbelievers of the world has their perspective. What do we do when we find ourselves at odds with our culture or even our, our brother over a significant issue? Um, let's, let's, let's go first. Let's look at kind of the, the source that had arisen. What are the sources of this disagreement? Um, in this case, with regard to the Jews, from their earliest days, their earliest of memories would have um, been centered around teaching of the law, uh, how to live it out in their household, what they could eat, what they couldn't eat. And for them, the law of Moses, it was given to God's people, Old Testament, right, was given to God's people to set them apart as God's chosen people, the nation of Israel. These are God's chosen people, and this is how you walk in holiness. And so there were all sorts of laws about uh, what foods were clean, what foods were unclean, garments that you could wear, like different sorts of fabrics or uh, things that you could wear and couldn't wear, and it all came down to clean or unclean, holy versus unholy. It would govern what you could touch or not touch, what you could do and not do, and even in Levitical law, it required that early age, all of the males would have to be circumcised. So the gospel has gone out from the Jews who all believe this, who all knew it. They lived the law for their whole life, and now it goes to the Gentiles who know nothing of the Old Testament law. As a matter of fact, what they know is their pagan forms of worship. They know worship in pagan temples, which was often, they were often filled with sexual immorality. They would make sacrifices to their gods, and they would eat these feasts and, 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 and just engage in all sorts of these practices. And so you take the two groups and you put them together in a church, and you can imagine there would be some friction. If you were a devout Jew who observed the Pentateuch, the, the Old Testament law, the Torah, um, it would have been really hard for you to share a meal with a Gentile. Gentiles didn't eat the right foods. They didn't wear the right clothes. They didn't undergo ceremonial washing. They probably weren't circumcised. And so everything about them would have felt unclean or unholy to you. And so there were some believers from Judea who come down to the church at Antioch. If you don't live like us, if you don't observe the law of the Old Testament, you don't undergo circumcision, you cannot be saved. So how do we handle this when we're at odds with culture? The first thing that I want you to see for us as the church of Jesus Christ, if we're going to kind of walk this out, live as disciples, be the church in a, in a, in a culture that doesn't always agree with us, um, number one, we have to seek 
and to stand on the truth. We seek after and we stand on the truth. One of the things we're going to say to you over and over and over, if our kids could just like leave this place and have this in their mind, that and no matter what circumstances they encounter, what it is they face, if they would just ask, what does the Word of God have to say about that? What does the Word of God have to say about how I conduct myself when I leave here and go to college? What does the Word of God say about the kind of person that I want to marry? What does the Word of God say about how I should think about this particular situation? We encourage you in this to seek after the truth. Now, God has kind of given us three gifts, not kind of, he has. He has given us three gifts uh, as a body to help us know the truth. The first one I've already mentioned, it is the word of God. Uh, We have enclosed in the scriptures God's word, which Paul writes to Timothy and says it is literally breathed out by God. God has given us his word that we may know him, God is truth, that we may know the truth about how we should live, about how we should conduct ourselves, about who God is, about what he has done. And so God has given us his word enclosed in the scriptures for us to know. Now, men, I just want to say this to you. You have a family to lead. You have yourself to take care. You have kids. You have a spouse. Like uh, For us, If we're supposed to be heads, if we're supposed to lead, we better know the truth. Because if we get led astray, we take people with us. And so I just want to encourage you men to look to the word that before you make a decision or the purchase or the job or whatever it might be, you ask yourself, what does the word of God have to say about that? And you lead your family accordingly. So that's gift number one. We have the word. Now, if you're intimidated by the word, you to read the scriptures, and you're like, I don't understand it all, I need help, or whatever. Listen, here's the beauty of it. God has not left us without help, but God has given us the Holy Spirit to illuminate the word for us. And so if you feel intimidated uh, in reading and understanding the word, you have the gift of the Holy Spirit within you who empowers you to read and to understand the word of God, to know how to lead your family, how to care for them well. And so uh, first gift is the word, the second gift is the Spirit. And then if you're still conflicted, the third gift that God has given us is his church. You have wise men and women around you. Uh, We say in our community groups all the time, um, what we want you to do for each other. When you face these difficult issues in your life, you're not sure which way to go, um, that one of the things that you would do is to counsel one another biblically. Your opinions are great. I think, I think my opinions are really exceptional, but they pale in comparison to the Word of God. And so we don't get, counsel each other with our opinions. We don't give each other worldly advice, but we counsel one another biblically. Sometimes I'm so immersed in a situation that I can't hardly see my way out but other people speaking the truth of God's word into my life, it helps me see the things I need to see. So we seek and we stand on the truth. Look what the Apostle Paul and Barnabas did here. It was actually a decision of the church at Antioch. Verse 2, it says, And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. Again, No small issue. This is a big deal. Now, this is interesting because the Apostle Paul is an apostle. He knew the truth. But this was so significant. And this issue is actually going to carry forward. You're going to see this in much of the New Testament, especially Paul's letters that he writes to the churches. You're going to see the Jews continually trying to get the Gentile believers to follow the law. And so uh, God and his sovereignty said, we're going to do it this way. We're going to go to the apostles in Jerusalem, the church where it was established, where, where Pentecost happened, and we're going to nail down this issue. So they travel to the, the, the church there. <clears throat> in verse 3 it says, So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversation, uh, the conversion, sorry, of the Gentiles, and brought great joy to all the brothers. And when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. Now, do y'all ever have an unpopular opinion that you're in a group of people, you know, and maybe like at home when no one's listening or it's just you and your spouse or you and your kids or your friends, you'll voice that opinion. You're like, well, here's what I think, right? You're kind of bold about it. But then if you're in a room full of experts, 
you might be a little more timid. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I might do a little more listening, a little less talking. Uh, that's not what's happening here. The, the people, uh, the Pharisees who believe that you have to be circumcised to be saved, y'all, they're putting it out there. They're not shy about it. As a matter of fact, in front of the apostles themselves, they're, they're laying out. We think not only do they need to be circumcised, they need to keep the law of Moses if they're going to be genuine believers of Jesus Christ. Like they've got to do all these things as well. So in verse 6, we see the apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, this, there had been some back and forth here. There were various perspectives being discussed. Uh, but Peter stood up <clears throat> and he said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having, and hear this, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Not by circumcision and not by keeping the law, not by uh, undergoing some religious ritual, their hearts were cleansed by faith. And he asked them, Why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. So we seek after the truth. What is the truth of God's word? And then, church, this is where it gets more difficult for us. We have to stand on the Word of God. What Peter just said here is really significant for us to know. If we know the truth, but we don't stand in it, it's almost as bad as if we didn't know the truth at all. What Peter says here about the Pharisees, he says, now, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither we nor our fathers could bear? Uh, he's saying, why are you opposing God? You're putting God to the You are, are, in a sense, you are tempting God. You're getting in a place of his opponent uh, here by trying to place other requirements on the believers. And so for us as the church of Jesus Christ, what we want to do is we want to stand where God stands, right? We want to be on his side, not in opposition to him, but we want to be on the side of God. And here's the thing, if God's on your side, you win every single time, right? It may not go exactly the way that we want it to. We may not be the most popular people in our culture. The thing that you say may not get you accolades and applause, but if you stand on God's side with him on the truth, you are giving people the gift because truth is what sets us free. It is the truth which ultimately leads us to life because truth isn't just an idea. Truth is a person. Jesus said, I am the way and I am the truth and I am the life. And so if we're going to call people to follow Jesus, they're going to have to walk in the truth. And so we don't back away from that. As a matter of fact, if we do, even if it kind of ingratiates to us to a group of people, we find ourselves in opposition to God. So what is the truth that they established here? Because they, they did. They got together. They had a debate. They worked through the issues. What is the truth that they established? <clears throat> the truth is, the truth of the gospel, we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Saved by grace through faith alone. Now, you might find it a little bit odd that people would show up in the church and be like, well, yes, you come to faith in Jesus and you trust in him and his work on the cross and you need to get circumcised. Like that would be a really strange thing for one of us to argue. Or to say to people, um, yes, you come to faith in Jesus and believing in his work, but you also have to not wear garments of two different sorts of fabric or uh, any other requirement we may place. And while we would say, man, that's ridiculous that, that they would ever come into a church and say those things, did you know that very subtly, if we're not careful, we do the same thing? If we're not careful, we kind of fall into the role of these Pharisees here. And essentially, if we're not careful, we would say, if you don't dress like us and eat like us and act like us, then you don't really belong here. We have to be really careful as the church 
we've been here a long time. We kind of know our culture here. We live in eastern Oklahoma, right? This is how we act. This is kind of how things go. And someone who comes in from the outside who might see things a little differently, might act a little differently, that we don't, in, in a sense, try to place our perspectives, our undue burdens upon them. The truth of this is, and what Peter calls on them, is says, let's not place a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor us have been able to bear. Now, in, in the first century, this was the yoke of the law. Now, one of the questions that I hear a lot, uh, and I, I was a youth pastor, and so I got it all the time then, and sometimes from adults, or you might see it online, is why in the world do Christians pick and choose what parts of the Bible that they choose to believe, right? When you try to stand on truth, uh, people will often push, push back against that. They don't always want to hear what you have to say. So why do we pick and choose what parts of the Bible that we believe? or that we would ultimately live out. And the way that I would answer that, um, we do that because the Bible tells us to. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 23 through 26, it says this. The Apostle Paul writing to the church of Galatia. He says, Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian. Your translation might say tutor. The law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian or a tutor. So, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. So here's what God did. God gave us the law, and it was good of him to give us the law to make us conscious that we are indeed sinners. If you're here today and, and you're not really sure if you're a sinner, let me just encourage you to go read the first five books of the Old Testament. See how well you've kept the law, uh, because if, you, if you've read it, I promise you know you haven't kept it. Every single one of us in this room have sinned against God. We've gone our own way. We have not kept the law, but here's the beauty of it. The gospel is good news, not because we picked and chose these commands that we wanted to live and we couldn't live up to these others. The gospel is good news is that none of us could live up to any of the commands in the Bible, but God sent his son Jesus in the flesh, and he came and he fulfilled the law perfectly. Jesus did it all, every single jot and tittle, every piece of the law, Jesus fulfilled it. And then Jesus went to the cross. And he offered himself as a substitute for us. The wages of our sin was death. What we deserved was eternal punishment. And yet Jesus Christ, who fulfilled the law perfectly, he went to the cross for us. And he bared the punishment that we deserved for sin. The perfect died for the imperfect. And when we, we talk about the cross, uh, we often say that the great exchange occurred. For those of us who have come to faith in Jesus Christ... There on the cross, God took the sins of the world and he placed all of the sins upon Jesus. And God poured out his wrath upon sin. For those of us who come to faith in Jesus Christ, God took that perfect righteousness of Jesus and he applied it to our account. That's why it's good news. That's why we rejoice at the sharing of the gospel. That's why we look to the law and we see that the law was good because it led us to faith in Jesus Christ like it was part of God's perfect redemptive plan. But for those of us who are now have come to faith in Jesus Christ, we're no longer under the law. Why do we obey some parts of the Bible and not the others? Because the Bible tells us to. For those of us who have come to faith in Christ, we are no longer under the law. So that's the truth. That's what Peter established here. And that's what James is going to reiterate. As a matter of fact, James, the brother of Jesus, in verses 12 through 18, um, he's going to quote some Old Testament prophecy. He's going to tell us what the Word has to say about the Gentiles coming in. He's going to show that this is part of God's perfect plan of redemption, bringing the Gentiles in. And then in verse 19, he says, Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. Because of what God has done here, because we've seen that they've received the Holy Spirit by faith, just like we did, uh, we shouldn't trouble those of the Gentiles. But remember the question I was asking is, how should the church respond when we find ourselves at odds with culture? And I told you we should seek and stand on the truth. But that's not all that we should do. 
there's an interesting but here in this sentence because you would think if we only care about the truth, right, we've got it. Saved by grace through faith. This is what James says, my judgment, we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. But then there's the but. But we should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from what has been strangled, and from blood. And then we just, then we just hear we're not under law. I mean, that's law stuff, right? Like meat, blood, meat of strangled animals. What? He says, verse 21, For from ancient generations Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogues. How should the church respond when we find ourselves at odds with culture? Number one, we seek and we stand on the truth. But number two, we serve others in love. The gospel issues have been clarified. Saved by grace alone, right? Uh, through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Not by other things. We're not saved by keeping the law. The law has no part whatsoever. As a matter of fact, in Galatians uh, chapter 5, verse 6, the Apostle Paul says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. There is a tendency in our culture uh, that you're going to be on one side or the other of this. You're going to be a truth-oriented person, right? By gosh, we stand on the truth. And if we know the truth, like you don't walk away from that. And so you might look at some of the things that happen in our culture and you get kind of indignant, right? A little bit frustrated, like you know the truth, like you should walk in it. What's wrong with you? Like it can be almost frustrating because sometimes culture turns the truth on its head and they seem to do the opposite of what would be right. And so there's a truth-oriented person, but then there's the love-oriented person. Right? Well, we just need to love them. Isn't that who Jesus is? If we're going to be Christians, we just need to love people. That's what God did, right? If we're going to follow Jesus, we do what he did. We love other people. And what you need to know is that those two things should never be held in opposition to one another. As a matter of fact, uh, both of those things are from God. God is truth and God is love. Our responsibility is to reflect God to a watching world. So as disciples of Jesus Christ, we are following him. We follow him in the truth, and we follow him in love. And listen, you shouldn't have one without the other. I, actually, if we're going to give people God, we can't give them truth without love because God is love. And if we're going to give people love, we can't give them love without the truth because God is also the truth. And so, yeah, we seek and we stand on the truth, but we serve other people in love. Do you remember the compassion that Jesus Christ showed to people? that were found to be in sin, the woman at the well. And she didn't show up out there with Jesus. And he's like, are you kidding? How many times are you going to get married? Obviously, this isn't working out, right? This is what we say about people who've been divorced a lot. How many, how many times uh, do you have to get married before you realize that you're the problem, right? These terrible things that come from people with, with wrong hearts, and even that's me at times, right? That's not what Jesus did. He saw a woman who had thirst who was longing to be filled, who needed the gospel of Jesus Christ to satisfy the deepest longings of her soul. So yeah, he tells her, I know, you're living with another guy, it's not your husband. But I want to give you something that when you get this, you'll never thirst again. Listen, this is the heart of God for our world. This is the heart of God that led Jesus to us. We too thirst, right? We too were longing, looking for something to satisfy us. And we found life in Jesus Christ. Every one of us has experienced redemption. And so as we approach people with whom we might be at odds, a culture with whom we often disagree, our tone is not anger. It's not condemnation. It's not disgust. It's love. Because we're, we're following Jesus and inviting people to follow him with us. Yeah. We tell them the truth because we love them. We want it, you know, the truth is given for our good. We show them love because we love them and we want it for their good. We want them to know the love of Christ. So serving others in love, a couple of ways that we can do that. Number one, we can show compassion for their perspectives. Every single one of us there was a time in our lives where we weren't following after Jesus. 
There was a time when we've rebelled and we've gone our own way. We've followed our fleshly desires. Even today, we often know, like, here's kind of what I want to do, but I know God's way is perfect. And so when we encounter people who aren't walking in the truth, who don't necessarily follow Jesus like us, uh, we can have compassion on that perspective and we can show grace. We can show patience to people who aren't necessarily walking in the truth because that's what God did for us. Over the course of our lives, God has been patiently drawing us into a relationship with him where we know him and we love him and we follow him. Sometimes we start to love the things of the world too much. and We turn away from Jesus and he patiently, kindness in kindness, he draws us back to himself. So we show compassion for other perspectives. Even though we know the truth, right? We show compassion there and then we serve people sacrificially. Do you know how the Bible tells us that the world is going to know that we're the disciples of Jesus Christ? By the love that we show one for another. And our concern for people doesn't end when we speak the truth. Our concern and our love for people is shown down the road. We continue to walk with them. We love them. This might be your coworker. It might be a classmate or a teacher at school. And they might believe crazy things. But one of the ways that we evidence the love of Jesus Christ for them is by reflecting the love that Christ showed to us back to the person. We sacrificially serve them, offer ourselves to them. We pray for them. We bear with them through difficult things. We may differ. You know the only way that we came to a knowledge of the truth? Is that God in His grace, by the power of His Spirit, He transformed our hearts. He gave us eyes that see and ears that hear. And we pray for that, for the watching world, for those who are around us who rub us the wrong way and believe things that we would never believe. And we seek after and we stand on the truth. And then we serve other people in love, asking God to do through us what we could never accomplish in ourselves. But we ask God to continue the work that he's done. Uh, look at the result here. In verse 30, skipping down just a bit, um, the apostles, the elders, they decided we're going to write a letter and we're going to distribute it to the churches who have had this quite a bit of dissension and debate over this issue. It says, so when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered a congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. The gospel of Jesus Christ is good news. When they heard the truth delivered in love, I mean, think about the sacrifices the Gentiles had to make here. I can't eat Meat that's been slaughtered in a particular way. I can't have a good old ribeye that's medium rare. Like They gave up some things in service to their brothers and sisters in Christ. The Jews had these deeply held beliefs. What These things were offensive to them. But when they sought after and stood on the truth and chose to serve one another in love, they knew, man, Moses has been declared in the synagogues. These people feel like this is terrible, so we're going to avoid these things. They rejoiced because of the encouragement. This is our perspective. This is how we respond when we face disagreement with our world. We offer ourselves in service to them and we pray that we might rejoice with encouragement together with them. Would you bow with me? Lord Jesus, again, we thank you for your word, for your spirit who leads us. God, I pray that we would be a church that stands on the truth but God, don't let us be those kind of people that that's all we do. We just like beat our drums about the truth and we don't look at the world with the same love and compassion that you saw them with. Lord, may we love as you have loved us. May we be more than willing to sacrifice things that we're free to enjoy uh, on behalf of our fellow man. Lord, I pray that you would use us as a light in the midst of darkness. May this world, may the people we work with, our neighbors, our friends, Peers, God, may they know us by our love that we have one for another. Father, we're thankful for your spirit. We pray that you would lead us in Jesus' name. Amen.